2021 saw the end of a difficult and tragic chapter in a family's life. Mark Allen Redwine was born on August the 24th, 1961. By 2012, Mark had been divorced twice, was living in La Pata County in southwest Colorado, and he was also locked in a fierce and contentious custody battle with his ex-wife Elaine Hall over their 13-year-old son, Dylan Redwine. To say that the custody battle was having an impact on their two sons was a bit of an understatement, but Dylan and his older brother, Corey, knew that they wanted to live with their mother and have nothing to do with their father anymore. The relationship between them was all incredibly strained, but things became even more difficult when Corey and Dylan stumbled upon one of Mark's dark secrets while on a trip with him. While using his computer, Corey and Dylan found pictures of Mark wearing a red bra, his face covered in what looked like feces. The boys snuck the laptop into the bathroom while their father slept, shocked and disturbed by a side of their father that they had never seen before. Neither of them mentioned seeing the pictures while they were on the trip together, but Corey saved them on his phone, and when he got into an argument with Mark through text messages later on, he used them. Mark had taken Dylan on another trip, a trip that Dylan wasn't particularly excited about going on, but he went anyway, and he had no clue that Corey was in the middle of a fierce dispute with Mark. During the messages, Corey wrote, Hey beautiful, you are what you eat, look in the mirror. The argument continued, but Dylan didn't find out about it until he'd gone back home to his mother, but when he did, it probably gave him an idea. When he was forced into visiting his father in a court-ordered visit for Thanksgiving of 2012, Dylan had a plan. He texted Corey saying, Hey, send me those poop pics of Papa because he gave me a speech about you guys being a bad example and I want to show him who he really is. When November 18th rolled around, Elaine reluctantly put Dylan on a plane, having no idea that her son planned on confronting his father the next time that he saw him. She knew that Dylan didn't want to go. They had spoken about it and Dylan had texted both friends and relatives to say that he didn't want to see his father, but Elaine had a pretty serious threat looming over her head. Her lawyer had advised her that if she tried to deny Mark his visitation rights, especially before the custody battle had been settled, then she faced the serious possibility of prosecution. Backed into a corner, Elaine said goodbye to her son, but Dylan was resourceful. He had already worked out a deal with one of his friends in La Plata and they'd agreed to let him stay the night at their home. When Mark picked up Dylan at the airport, they were caught on camera. The footage showed almost no interaction between the two of them, and the same could be said for when they were caught on camera later in the day at a Walmart in Durango. But at some point, Dylan told Mark that he was going to spend the night at a friend's place and Mark told him that he could not go. It was possibly this argument that tipped him over the edge and had Dylan finally decided to confront his father, but the exact events of that night are difficult to pin down. What we do know is that Dylan reached out to the friend he was supposed to be staying with and told him that he would be coming around in the morning instead. He was planning to be there at 6.30, but by 6.45 Dylan still hadn't shown up. His friend, already concerned, texted Dylan, but he didn't get an answer. According to Mark, he'd left Dylan at home in the morning of the 19th to run some errands, but by the time he had come back, Dylan was gone. Mark said there was a bowl of cereal on the counter and Nickelodeon was on in the living room, but Dylan had just appeared to have vanished. Mark said that he was worried that a stranger had taken him, or maybe even that Dylan had run away and been attacked by the wildlife in the mountains that surrounded Mark's home, and he reported him as missing to the police. The police took this disappearance seriously. 
They and the community began a massive search of the mountains and woods around the home, and they informed Elaine that Dylan was missing. Elaine immediately set out on a six-hour drive to La Plata, desperate to do whatever she could to help in the search for her son. But she did find a moment along the way to send a message. During the drive, she texted Mark saying, He wouldn't just leave. He would have called me. I am so suspect of you right now. How could he just disappear? Elaine made it to La Plata, immediately joining in the search, but at Mark's house, a totally different story was playing out. At a time when the police and the community were out in the dark, torches in hand and combing the wilderness for his son, Mark was at home, and by 2300 hours that evening, he was in bed and the lights were off. Things only continued to look worse for Mark in the following months when he took to the media. By then, another of his ex-wives had come forward to talk about her experiences dealing with Mark during a custody battle, and what she said would only raise more concerns about Dylan. She said that during a previous discussion she had had with Mark, he told her that if she had ever needed to get rid of a body, then he'd leave it in the mountains. This was quickly followed by a threat where Mark warned her that he would, quote, kill the kids before he let her have them. In an effort to fend off accusations from Elaine, Corey and the other people from his past, Mark made what is now a notorious appearance on the Dr. Phil show. During the show, both Elaine and Mark continued to throw accusations at each other, and everything ended when Mark refused to take a lie detector test. Still on the case, law enforcement were able to get several warrants to search Mark's home, and that only made Dylan's case look more grim. They found traces of his blood in Mark's living room, and then they searched the home with cadaver dogs. The dogs indicated that there had been a corpse in the living room and in the bed of Mark's truck. They also detected traces of a corpse in the washing machine and on the clothes that Mark had reported himself as wearing on the night of November 18th, 2012. That was the biggest break they'd had in the case, but that all changed approximately seven months after Dylan had gone missing. On the 27th of June 2013, about eight miles or around 13 kilometres from Mark's house, the partial remains of a boy were found about 100 yards off of an ATV trail. They were quickly identified as belonging to Dylan, and Dylan's case officially turned into a homicide investigation. As if the proximity to Mark's home wasn't enough to cast more suspicion on him, Mark also drove an ATV, but there was more. A witness recalled seeing Mark driving in the area of the mountains in April of 2013, right before he left town, and refused to come back when some of Dylan's remains were found in June of that year. Even though the discovery of Dylan's remains changed the shape of the investigation, they didn't provide the investigators with a cause of death. Dylan's skull was missing, and with what was left, there wasn't enough evidence to disprove Mark's theory that Dylan had run away, or maybe even had been attacked by wildlife while out on a walk. That was until November 2015, when a pair of hikers found a skull about two miles along the road. Another test quickly identified it as having belonged to Dylan, and the investigators finally had what they needed to prove that Dylan had been murdered. His skull showed several knife wounds, particularly around his left eye, that looked like they had been inflicted at, or at least near, the time of death. Testimony from wildlife experts then proved that there were no animals in the area that would have carried his skull that far away from the rest of his remains. This meant that someone had purposefully left his skull there and made sure that it was far away from the rest of his body. Many people believed that it was Mark who had killed him. On July the 17th, 2017, almost five years after Dylan had gone missing, Mark was arrested for second-degree murder and child abuse, but that was only the beginning of another long and arduous court battle. When the prosecution were finally able to take him to court, they faced another set of delays when the pandemic knocked back his trial date another three times. 
Finally, in 2021, Mark had his day in court, where the prosecution argued that Dylan confronted Mark with the pictures of himself, causing Mark to fly into a fit of rage and kill his son. They used the evidence of Mark's strange behaviour and reluctance to join in the searches for his missing son as proof that he already knew that his son was deceased, but they had to base a lot of their case on circumstantial evidence. The defence argued that things had been difficult between them, but that was probably why Dylan had taken off while Mark had been out of the house and he'd been caught up in some terrible accident. They stuck to their theory that Dylan had been attacked by wildlife and that Mark was innocent, but after five weeks of hearing testimony, the jury disagreed. They came back with an unanimous verdict, saying that Mark was guilty of both charges of second degree murder and child abuse. It was then all up to Judge Jeffrey Wilson to figure out Mark's sentence, where Mark could face anything from 12 to 48 years in prison, and the judge came down on him hard. I have trouble remembering a convicted criminal defendant that has shown such an utter lack of remorse for his criminal behaviour, he said, right before he sentenced Mark to 48 years. Mark did not speak at his sentencing, but he did write a statement which the judge then read. He said, Innocent of all charges, miscarriage of justice, fake conviction, sham trial. I take this circumstance very seriously and want to make clear that I too have lost a child I love more than life itself. I will fight for true justice, not for myself, but for Dylan. I have always shown remorse for the things that I am guilty of stand against fake justice.